simulating quantum system with Kiske Dynamics. Hey, hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This has been an enjoyable day so far. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a newish package in, in Kiskit. So if, if people aren't familiar, Kiskit is like the open source like umbrella of packages that, uh, that IBM develops. Um, and so this new newer package, it's been out for about a year that I'm going to talk about is called Dynamics. Um, and I'll explain what it is. But um, just wanted to say first, like I'm kind of the lead developer and organizer and maintainer of this package, but uh, there's been a lot of other contributors um, all listed here, most of which are at IBM, but some of them are, are external as well. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so here's my outline. So I'm just going to talk about what kind of simulation we're doing and why we're doing it. Why did we want to build this package? I'll talk about, um, and in particular, I'll say here I'm talking about simulation of the dynamics of the quantum system. So like Schrodinger equation, Lindblad equation, stuff like that. So every time I say simulate in this talk, I'm, I'm talking about that type of simulation and not circuit simulation um, and classical simulation of, of these things <laughs> to clarify. Uh, yeah, so I'll just talk about, well, you know, why, why do we want to do that? What are the applications we have in mind? Um, I'll talk about kind of what's out there in terms of open source packages. Um, if you want to do this kind of simulation, what, uh, what do you want to look for in a package and what kind of packages are out there? Um, obviously, then I'll, I'll talk about our package, um, but, you know, it's important to know what's out there if, if you're going to do something, what, uh, to know what, what are the available tools. Um, and then, yeah, so once I start talking about uh, dynamics, I'll just kind of generally describe the features. I'll show some code examples doing like uh, some standard things. Um, and then I have a couple slides on maybe let's say quote unquote results slides. So how does it perform? And then um, a new feature that was added recently. It's some advanced computational features. Uh, so simulate what? Uh, so this first sentence is kind of a tautology, but quantum devices are quantum systems. So when we want to understand what they're doing or work with them or optimize them in some way, at a physics level, you know, we model these things using quantum theory and the differential equations in quantum theory. So things like the Schrodinger equation, things like the Lindblad equation. Um, so th this is the level we're talking about uh, simulating the physics, a Hamiltonian uh, quantum description of the physics. Um, and why do we want to do that? Well, there's certain sort of workflows that um, people use simulation for. Um, you know, it's basically like, Simulating these things, solving these differential equations, show you how your models play out in time. Um, and so that's how you sort of realize your knowledge of the system or build your knowledge of the system. So first building device models, you have a bunch of experimental data, you know, does your model of the system reproduce that data or not? If it does, great. If not, <clears throat> you're going to want to tweak that model in some way. You simulate to see, does it match it or not? Similarly, uh, control design. So this is one that I'm particularly very interested in. You know, you have a model or a class of models for your system, and you want to design a control sequence that will implement some gate, and maybe you want it to be robust within some parameter ranges or something like that. So you can use simulation for that. So you try to optimize uh, some control uh, sequence to do something you want, given, you know, your model information. Uh, and then another thing, so this is a picture, there's this uh, package as well in Qiskit called, called Qiskit Metal for designing superconducting chips and something that, you know, we're kind of working with people internally is, you know, at the design stage, you're trying to play around with things, see what you can design. Um, and then you need to decide, are you going to build this thing or not? Um, and so you can use simulation to see, okay, does this design kind of do what you want? Um, obviously, in, at the end of the day, you need to build things and see what happens. But you know, this can be very informative, like even in principle, does this thing do what I want or not? And if it doesn't, then you don't have to spend all the money and time to, to build that device and, and watch it fail. Uh, so that's generally what we're trying to do with these things. Um, and of course, you know, this is a computation focused audience, so I don't need to convince anybody of this, but faster is always better with these research applications. You know, you need to simulate these things thousands and thousands and thousands of times, maybe varying the parameters a bunch of times, or you're doing an optimization and just continuously evaluating some objective function. Um, so the faster you can simulate these things, obviously, the more complicated sort of research you can do incorporating simulations. Um, and, you know, the classic thing in quantum systems is as you add more and more subsystems, things grow exponentially in terms of the dimension of the differential equation. Um, so that's a big problem, and people are interested in. HPC utilization for these this reason. 
Um, but another thing I wanted to point out is there's the other curse of dimensionality too, which is even if you're looking at small systems, you know, they might have a lot of model parameters. And so you want to explore this parameter space for some reason, maybe it's optimizing controls or learning a model or something like that. Um, and so even in small systems, you, there's still benefits to continuing to improve and find faster methods and speed things up. Um, and I make this point because a lot of people, you know, rightly so are interested in larger system sizes. Um, but I think sometimes that obscures the fact that even smaller system sizes, um, you know, if you just want to do one simulation, that's fine. Um, but for these higher level applications, even in that domain, you want to speed things up. Uh, yeah. Okay, so if you're looking, if you want to do this kind of simulation, I just wanted to sort of lay out like, what are the types of features you might want to look for? So this is kind of now just a general thing. Um, obviously, the foundation of a package that does this kind of simulation is going to be the numerical tools, um, different differential equation solvers, different you know ar array libraries or representations, uh, hardware utilization using GPUs, HPC things. Is that you know you want to have those things built into it to some extent? Um, then at a slightly higher level, you're going to have model building and analysis tools. So being able to describe the simulation to build you know your Hamiltonian in whatever way the package accepts. Can you do that conveniently or not? Uh, then once you have built that and you do your simulation, can you analyze the results effectively or not? Um, and then at the higher level, you're going to want, you might be looking for, you know, things that enable certain higher level workflows that incorporate these lower level things. So control optimization, model fitting, things like this. Uh, and again, this, this is a uh, computation focused audience, so I don't need to tell you this, but whenever I'm talking to like you know, device physicists or something, I always need to, you know, make this clear, you know, critically, the technical capabilities we need are speed and flexibility. So being able to like, specify things in a really generic way, because these systems have a lot of variation. Um, but, and this is the point that I was kind of mentioning in terms of this being a computation focused audience, you really want things to be able to be compilable and automatically differentiable. So you can do these more complicated things more quickly, um, and in particular, obviously, with automatic differentiation, uh, doing optimization applications. So here's a non-exhaustive picture of you know open source packages out there. I just keep like adding things to this every time I learn about them, like this blockade I learned about today. <laughs> so I added it to this picture. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of packages out there. I'm not going to talk about every single one, but you know I think the most famous one is Qtip, which has been around for a really long time. Um, and this is a Python package. And it, it does much more than just simulate the dynamics of quantum systems, which I'm talking about now. Um, but it's a really sort of feature complete package. It's maybe a bit older. It does. It, I think they're working to do like TensorFlow integration, but it doesn't have that right now. Um, but they do have some things for doing you know, control optimization, some more specialized, non-automatically differentiable versions of it. Uh, so yeah, there's Python packages. Um, Torch Quantum was one that I learned about recently. And so, yeah, they have, they're integrated with PyTorch, so you can differentiate everything, which is really nice. Um, Julia packages are all obviously nice. We don't work with Julia um, because Kiskit is just in Python, so we default have to use Python um, at IBM, um, at least as the main interface uh, language. Uh, but Julia is really nice because it has a really powerful uh, ODE library and uh, I don't know all the details, but uh, there's very general automatic differentiation in, in Julia as a language itself. Uh, so there's lots of things out there. If you're doing this kind of simulation, I recommend you know looking around. Um, but now I'll specifically tell you about uh, our package. So Qiskit Dynamics is a new package, as I've said, uh, in Qiskit, uh, in Python for Hamiltonian and Lindblad simulation. Central applications of interest are optimization and this virtual prototyping idea that I mentioned. And the main features, um, the main thing that we're really going for, um, I've already mentioned being able to compile and automatically differentiate. But the, the first point here is really like one of the main design elements of the package is you want to be able to configure everything. There's lots of different elements to that when you solve these differential equations. And every problem is different. There's no best ODE solver or best uh, you know, array representation for for all possible problems. Um, so you want to use it to be able to, for any given problem, just say, oh, I'm going to use this solver. I'm going to use this array representation. And I'm going to do these transformations on the model and find what the best thing is for that application before you know 
doing something that requires thousands of evaluations of these things. And of course, as a Qiskit package, um, the package is relatively new. So in terms of integration with uh, the rest of Qiskit, we're still sort of working on that, but um, that's, that's the goal. We'll integrate it more with there. Um, so in terms of the features in the package itself, so the current version is 0.3.0. And I would say the last couple of releases, or sorry, the first releases up to this point have been really about sort of solidifying the numerical foundation. So in terms of solvers, you know, there's going to be the classic ODE solvers, um, but there, we also have geometric solvers available, which are just, you know, for the specialized class of differential equations, um, there's other solvers that you can use, like exp matrix exponential based solvers. Uh, in terms of array types, obviously dense and sparse, um, and you can choose between NumPy and JAX as the main array representation. So all of our uh, compilation, automatic differentiation and whatnot is due to JAX uh, compatibility, um, which I mentioned here. Um, and something that we've added in the last release um, is a module doing time-dependent perturbation theory uh, numerically. So you can compute very general expansions uh, numerically, and there's certain specialized solvers built out of that, which I'll mention in a, in a future slide. On top of that, you can build models um, in sort of standard decompositions. I think most like uh, most uh, packages will have some version of this. Um, so you know, generic Hamiltonian decomposition, for example, uh, with um, a standard representation of mixed signals um, in terms of sort of arbitrary functions for the envelopes and some frequency. Uh, one thing which I think is uh, unique to this package, at least currently, or as far as I'm aware, is certain model transformation. So I can write down a Hamiltonian like this, and then I can, for example, just say, oh, when I do my simulation, I want it to be in some arbitrary rotating frame. So I can just pass it some HF, and it'll do the computation in that rotating frame and do things behind the scenes to make it efficient to do that. And there's some nice, uh, for people that are familiar with these things, like you might be familiar with the idea that, oh, if I do a rotating wave approximation, so I enter a rotating frame and then do an approximation, you'll say, okay, the, the differential equation solver will run a lot nicer. You'll remove certain high frequency components and stuff like this. Um, and we've actually found that in practice, just entering the rotating frame, which is a mathematical transformation, doesn't change the solution in any way. I mean, it transforms it, but it's a reversible transformation, unlike the RWA. Just entering the rotating frame gives you most of the speed benefits as doing the full RWA um, in our experience so far. We don't have, I don't have like a nice plot for that right now, but uh, this is kind of a really nice thing. And it's something that I think makes the package quite fast. As I mentioned, yeah, we're working to do Qiskit integration. So when you build the operators for these models, um, you can use that, use Qiskit and all the tools um, that it has for analyzing things. Um, a major feature that is going to be for the next release is uh, doing pulse simulation. So if people are fam not familiar with that, pulse is a language in Qiskit for describing uh, time-dependent control signals. Um, and so if you want to like interact with the device through IBM's backend interface and you want to send specific control sequences down, you, you'll submit them as quote unquote, they call them pulse schedules within Qiskit Pulse. Um, and so we're working on making it so that it's easy to basically interact with the simulator in the exact same way as you would a real backend through Pulse. So that, that'll be coming up in the next couple months. Um, and then workflows, that's that's to come. Uh, we'll probably build uh, control optimization workflows into Dynamics or maybe somewhere else in Qiskit. But yeah, we'll definitely do stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the current snapshot. Um, maybe I'll go through this really quickly. This is just like a quick picture showing how you maybe define and solve a problem in dynamics. So say we have some simple Hamiltonian with um, a static operator here and then some other operator H1 and some time dependent control signal. This is how you would run a simulation and I'm going to highlight all the different options you can, you can select. So here you can choose between NumPy or JAX as the back end. So I'm telling it here to use JAX. I construct this solver instance with the model information. Um, and here I tell it internally represent things with dense arrays and solve in this rotating frame. And I can put any operator here, but here I'm putting the static Hamiltonian. I build my time dependence. So this S1 is going to be the signal object. I can specify the envelope as an arbitrary Python callable function. In this case, because things are being done with JAX, you would want it to be a JAX function. Um, and you can specify the carrier frequency. And then you call solve with standard sort of ODE 
solver uh, interface elements, the integration time, the initial state. Um, here you pass in the time dependence, but then you can choose you know whatever solver you want to do here. Um, so there's lots of different solvers that we integrate with. Um, so you can make your choice there. And again, depending on the problem, we see very different performance uh, from different solvers. Um, so yeah, all of those sort of configurable elements are, are shown here. Um, and then, yeah, this, this slide is um, with the pulse integration. Again, if you're not familiar with this, so you can use Qiskit pulse in this panel here to describe a control sequence. So this is like two back-to-back -back drag pulses with a virtual Z or a phase shift in the middle. Um, so you can you know, define that. You could send this to a real backend. Um, but so right now, we, you, we do have the ability to simulate these in Dynamics, not with the exact same interface as a real backend yet. But you can configure this solver to accept these things and simulate them, which there's a lot of interest for people that are interested in doing control research and stuff like this. Um, so instead of passing that signal object as before, you'll pass in this schedule and it'll solve. OK. So in terms of uh, speed for this thing, um, we always compare it, or not always, but we usually compare it to Q-tip because basically every time we show somebody this package, they say, how fast is it compared to Q-tip <laughs> as the sort of default? Um, so yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of what the simulation are, but it was a three transmon model. I forget how the dimensions broke down, but it, this is 160 dimensional simulation. Um, and what's being shown here is a 2D scan of control parameters. Um, and what they're looking at for this particular control sequence that uh, was being investigated is how much entanglement is there between two of the qubits. Um, so if you think about this as a computational problem, it's like, okay, you have a parameter scan simulation problem. Um, I think there's a thousand pixels here. Um, and so, you know, you have to go pixel by pixel. Obviously, this is a very parallelizable operation, but um, this, this little plot here on the side shows Q-tip if we want to simulate and obviously using the same accuracy parameters or tolerances. Uh, it took about 54 seconds with Q-tip on CPU, whereas with Dynamics, it took about 7.3 seconds. That's a nice speed up. Um, and then on GPU, this isn't a very big dimension, but on GPU, it took about 3.7 seconds. I forget what CPU we were using. This was either on a D100 or A100 GPU. Um, but the nice thing is even for these small dimensions, we found that if we use Jax's uh, vectorization transformations, you can vectorize the function that evaluates each pixel and then call it on actually an array that contains all the sort of parameter values at once and it'll run it all kind of in parallel. Um, and if you do that, it takes about 140 seconds. So a bit, about two minutes. Um, so this, this was something that was done with some internal researchers and this was uh, way, way faster than what they were doing before with Q-tip, uh, which was nice. One other thing I'll mention quickly before concluding um, is that we've added a perturbation theory module in the last uh, release. Um, and I, yeah, I don't have time to get into details, but um, perturbation theory expansions are usually used in control optimization applications to quantify robustness to various parameter rate uh, variations. Um, and so to do this in a numerical way, you need obviously code that'll compute these perturbation terms. Um, using yeah, numerically, you know, in a very general way to, to facilitate very general control parameterizations and whatnot. Uh, so we added this in the last release. Um, coincidentally, the paper with these algorithms has been posted to the archive today. Um, so here it is. This is a good timing. Um, but one thing which I can you know, easily explain is that there's we've built in some perturbative solvers. So solvers based on the Dyson series and Magnus expansion. They're basically like uh, series solution methods to differential equations. Um, and I'll quickly say before explaining this plot that these are, these are uh, what we built in was a variation um, from of an algorithm from a, a paper that's been, uh, that previously kind of introduced this general idea. Um, so this is a really nice paper and what we did is kind of based on that. But the idea here is you create these solvers that are fixed step solvers by doing uh, uh, series expansions and then taking small time steps. Um, and what they observed in this paper, which was like the key observation, was that um, the expansions at each time step can be translated to each other. So you only need to do this expansion computation one time. And then you can just like solve by doing like very few array operations. Um, and so this plot is just showing some configurations. So this was uh, the time that it took to run 100 uh, pulse parameters for a two qubit gate. 
And again, this is a small dimension, 25. Um, but when you look at vectorizing and stuff, so this plot hides the details, but we consider lots of different, like vectorizing over lots of different inputs and finding which one was the fastest and only plotting the fastest. But um, we see the traditional ODE solver. Oh, sorry, so we're plotting on the y-axis is average distance to a benchmark solution. So it's like, how accurate is it? Um, and then this is the total runtime. And you see the ODE solver, you know, is this line and uh, all of these perturbative solver instances are kind of living below. So here we're scanning different parameters in the perturbative solvers to see how well they perform and whatnot. And so you see things like, you know, an order of magnitude um, improvement in the time that it took to do this. I think this is quite technical. I think check out the paper if you're interested. Um, I think more investigation needs to be done with these things to sort of understand how to use them properly and whatnot, but it's it's still kind of cool and exciting. Um, so check that out. Okay, I'll close now. Hopefully I'm not over time. Um, so just to recap, it's talking about Qiskit Dynamics. Um, it's at its current version, 0.3.0. Uh, establishes sort of the core numerical foundation. It builds in things that allow you to do like automatic model transformations, compile and auto differentiate. Um, in the future, we will have a full Qiskit Pulse integration, so you can interact with the simulator in the same way you would with a real backend. And uh, that'll be really nice for doing certain research things. It's nice to be able to just quickly swap them in and out and interact with them in the exact same way. Um, so yeah, so it's an open source project. So you know, if you're interested, if you use it, please you know, submit issues, ask for help, and or contribute. You can check out the GitHub is here. There's lots of documentation, tutorials, um, user guide, uh, things like this. And if you're interested in chatting, there's also a uh, Slack uh, channel in the Kiskit workspace that you can reach out and, and, and I will respond personally. But <laughs> OK, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Thanks for the great talk. It's very interesting. We do have time for uh, maybe one quick question from the audience. Please feel free to put something in the chat or unmute yourself. It may, maybe I can ask you a quick question. I was wondering um, if you use the, the NumPy backend, do you need to specify like how do you compute the derivatives in that case? I assume with Jax, you always use their autograph backend, but with NumPy, what are you using there? So with NumPy, we don't. We don't do that. Um, if you want to compute derivatives, you'll have to just use JAX. Uh, okay, so you only current... support the forward, forward path. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, the NumPy inclusion, a lot of the sort of performance stuff, and whenever we want to do highly performant things, we just always use JAX. And the NumPy was kind of included as uh, just to make it so that a new user can get into things easily, I guess. Um, but we have found once you start going to some large system sizes and you're using say like the scipy sparse representation internally um, that it actually does kind of become comparable like the compilation just in terms of pure simulation time um, of Jax is like in the overhead of you know not having it be compiled in uh, scipy like the things kind of end up becoming somewhat comparable once the array operations start like fully dominating everything um, but yeah for derivatives and whatnot it, it has to be Jax. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And let's move to uh, 